सौंदर्य प्रतियोगिता होने अब विवेक को प्रतियोगिता होने नमस्ते वेलकम टू नेपाल टॉप सेवेन डिबेटर्स 2013 प्रोड्यूस्ड बाय टुडेज यूथ एशिया दिस इज द फाइनल राउंड इन द इंग्लिश कैटेगरी ऑफ ग्रेड 10, 11 एंड 12. The topic for today's debate is peace is possible without justice. Let me now introduce our panel of judges for today's final round. Our first judge is Mr. Santosh Shah. He is the president of today's Youth Asia. Our second judge is Dr. D. Aker. She is the interim director of the John B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at University of San Diego, USA. She is a conflict resolution professional. educator facilitator and psychological anthropologist working in conflict and post conflict communities a third judge is dr lilia velasquez she is a professor at california western school of law for the last 10 years she has focused on defending women's rights particularly victims of domestic violence refugee women and victims of trafficking for forced prostitution our finalists in the grade 10 11 and 12 english category are anushka pant of grade 10 from shri satya sai siksha sadan and urusha silva of grade 12 from st xavier school chawlakhel congratulations to both the finalists for making it to the final round of this national debate competition may i call up our first debater anushka pant to speak for the motion if you ask me about the most recurring dispute so far then it would be between a husband and a wife now just imagine the number of divorce cases that would be piled up if justice had been sought between such small disputes instead of peace This can be taken as an evidence from the fact that divorce cases in society like in US where justice is preferred to peace is comparatively higher than in places where peace is preferred. This situation can be extrapolated to various other cases in our society country and even in the whole world. Let's take an example of our own country Nepal. The 10 years long Maoist armed revolution did not end with justice. Justice was not given to those 13,246 dead in addition to many injured and disappeared victims. Now just imagine what would have happened if they would have tried to bring peace through justice. We would certainly have no peace because in the process of giving justice to those people the damages that would have occurred would be irreparable. Now we have chosen peace without justice. We have peace. Yes. There might be conflict in the mind of those people but time will certainly heal their wound and we will have peace forever. We can also take another example of Sri Lanka. The 26 years long civil war of Sri Lanka did not come to an end with justice. The Sri Lankan government forces imposed extreme violation of human right and there was forced disappearances. Now Uh, for the sake of justice we can certainly not compromise the peace achieved after 26 years long civil war and also it is not favorable because if we start giving justice to those people the peace will certainly be violated the difficult idea about justice is that it is not one fold there is legal justice moral justice social justice and many more and what we actually get from a court is always a legal justice for instance when there is a riot and lives and properties are destroyed the criminals if arrested will certainly be punished for the crime the state will prosecute them for having violated the law this is certainly justice but how does this justice help those people who have lost their dear ones who are perhaps their breadwinners how does this justice help those people who have lost their property and now live in poverty make peace just think about it Uh, my opponent might argue that uh, peace without justice is not sustainable but i'll give you a very good example of our neighboring country china in china there is no freedom of expression no women reproductive right the government has been continuously restricting religious acts and the ones suffering from hiv aids are discriminated there is no fairness there is no justice and usa which is thought to have All the essential foundation of judicial system in this modern world has five times more violent crimes 
than in uh, China as mentioned by the economist.com. You see, we can certainly have a sustainable peace even without justice. I'm not trying to argue that I do not want justice, but if justice and peace without justice are both at stake, I would definitely choose peace without justice without any reservation for the greater good. Thank you. I'd like to call upon stage Urusha Silva to speak against the motion. My opponent pointed out various flaws of the court, but my dear friend, justice is not only the verdict of the court. It depends on the fair treatment of all the people of the country and the world. Let's take example of our own country. Our government could not provide equal opportunities and recognition to the people of all communities. As a result, backward and suppressed people like Dalit, Zanzati, Madhesi and Adibasis had to revolt against the government through strikes which disturbed the peace process of Nepal. So as you can see, peace is not achieved through any sort of ideology nor does it depend on legislation. Rather, it depends on a just society where no individual becomes the victim of any kind of prejudices. The League of Nations was the first international organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace, but the League of Nations failed to incorporate equal justice to all its member countries, owing to craze for power that resulted in the outbreak of the Second World War. This vividly and explicitly explains that peace is unattainable without justice. When there is absence of justice, peace is always at risk. Let me give you an example. Nepal has already been the witness of this in its history. After the restoration of democracy in 2046 BS, some people felt that they were denied justice by the system, and there came a feeling of rebellion, which led to the formation of the Maoist force. And instead of restoring peace and harmony, and instead of restoring peace and harmony, disturbance, disruption and turbulence became prevalent in our country. Peace became vulnerable for 10 long years in Nepal. Recently, I heard a news in BBC which was titled as Under the Shadow of Everest, Nepali war victims are still longing for justice. Why? Why Nepali are still waiting for justice more than six years after the end of their brutal civil war? One of the victims, Purna Lama, wants to know what had happened to her husband Arjun, who was taken by the Maoists eight years ago for no reason. One day, she found out that he had been killed. Then she demanded to know why he was killed and to show her the dead body of her husband. But till now, nothing had happened. So, peace cannot be ensured in Nepal unless and until all the victims like Purnamaya receive full justice. Transitional justice has always become a core element of the peace process in Nepal. Realizing this importance, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Nepal is implementing peace through justice program, which is funded by the United Nations Peace Fund for Nepal. Even Martin Luther King Jr. has said, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, rather it is the presence of justice. Thank you. My opponent said that justice is a precondition for peace and that we cannot have peace without justice. Then tell me how are we going to have peace? How is peace to prevail as a natural consequence of justice if the justice given by the judge is not accepted by the people? Peace and justice have a very tenuous connection between them. Justice is a rather ambiguous term, whereas peace is a practical outcome. So peace cannot be guaranteed by justice. So we can also say that peace and justice do not have a better home in a society. But if we could bring peace without, uh, peace without justice and with forgiveness, that would be better. Let me give you an example of Truth Reconciliation Council, where the culprits uh, confess their crime and the victims uh, forgive the culprits. But if in this case the victims would have sought justice and not forgiven, the culprit would have risen to become rebellion and we would certainly not have peace. Thank you. For those who think that peace is possible without justice, are you trying to say that impunity should be the rule of law? Unbelievable. Let us talk about some international issues. 
Civil war in Syria grew out of the anti-government uprising that started in March 2011. Do you know what were the major causes of the conflict? The root causes of the conflict were political repression, uneven economy, minority, minority rule. As you can see, these are the different aspects of injustices that had led to war. Expecting peace without justice is like expecting a flower without a seed. If justice prevails, peace follows naturally as night follows the day. Thank you. Anushka and Urusa, wow. <laughs> this has been the best debate in the entire series of 2012 and 13, I must say. I have a lot of points to say, but I'm kind of speechless because I was so moved and touched by a lot of components that both of you brought because uh, it's a very difficult topic to, to debate. And uh, so far, you have done a great justice uh, to this topic. Um, Anuska, you, d you made a very good start on a very personal note, and y that really helps uh, your viewers and your judges to connect to you. And then you straight away took it to the Maoist insurgency, then you made, made an international point of view as well. You also expressed various kinds of justice and you, how you limited the whole global focus just on the legal system. That's a very smart connect from starting in a very short time, uh, taking it from a personal example to even telling the entire world that uh, their governments do not function very well when it comes to a justice system. And Ursa, I must say this has been your best performance in the entire series. We have forgotten how the Maoist insurgency had started. And you brought that memory back and you connected that to the lack of justice. And, uh, and connecting to Anuska's debate where we brought the Maoist into the peace process without justice. I think that's something you would want to bring after the, after the break in the second because that's something very interesting to, to listen from your side. I liked very much when you brought the personal story of Purnamaya. It's amazing uh, how you could balance a story in a debate because that's a very odd mix. All the best. The clarity and the examples that you, that you had were very, very important for each of you. The expression that you give it are obviously your own personal styles, which is um, always hard for judges to, to deal with because I think when you're out in the world and you're arguing your cases, that's very important and you have to trust that. So I respect both of your, your styles as you began to present this. I like the international combined with national examples. That's really important. And I think for your, I think you've been given a really tough topic to argue peace without justice and being able to frame it the way you did was very impressive to try and give people some sense of the cost of loss uh, of not having peace you know at some point or having some cessation of violence so I was very very impressed uh, Anushka it was it was very interesting approach I'm not sure that I have university students who could do half as well as you did with that topic so thank you um, and Arusha, I, I really enjoyed your use of the idea of seeds and flowers. Oftentimes in the world of conflict, we talk about the seeds of conflict being, not the seeds of peace, but the seeds of conflict being present. And if you don't deal with them in some way, in some kind of justice, that becomes the possibility of further, you know, uh, conflict down the road. So I think that, but that kind of imagery is very valuable as well as the personal local and the international stories. Thank you. I'm a law school professor and I have to judge law students and sometimes lawyers and I wish that half of them had the, f the passion that both of you demonstrated today. Anuska, uh, your fluency, uh, that passion that you have came across so powerfully that uh, you convinced me. Yeah. You know, and the same thing with your rebuttal. I think that that is important that in the rebuttal, what you want to do is pick just one area. You're not going to repeat yourself. You have to pick that one area you need to clarify you know, concerning your opponent's presentation. So that's what's going to round your persuasive argument to the public. And I think that you did that beautifully. In Arusha, your examples that you gave um, about you know, certain countries, um, truth and reconciliation, you know, a lot of stuff that has to do with forgiveness. But I believe that you also mentioned forgiveness. And, and that is a very important issue for, especially for us who want justice. 
Justice is never complete. Justice is never perfect. Even if you catch the criminal, they kill your family members, and that person is incarcerated for life, has justice really been accomplished? So justice is relative, I mean, because we cannot bring back the dead. So to both of you, uh, you were exceptional. We will now begin with the rebuttal round. I contradict my opponent's implications of seeking justice everywhere by saying that absolute justice is not possible. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, it mentions that justice is the fairness in which people are dealt with, which is in itself a relative definition. In our day-to-day -day life, we have to become the victims of various forms of injustice. Even in my way to this place, I had to witness it, just like uh, I did not get the female reservation seat in a microbus while I came to this place. There were boys in the street who teased me without any reason and many more. And I believe that everyone else over here are also having similar fate every day. Does this mean that I, everybody here, and all the members of the human world are not at peace at every second of their life? No, I cannot stop myself from denying that I am at peace despite the instances of minor injustices and I believe you all also feel the same. Now my argument goes towards 13 years back during the abolish, uh, abolishment of uh, lab, uh, bounded labors, uh, commonly known as Kamaya. Government had a dilemma to choose between justice and peace without justice. Justice demanded that the culprits be punished but taking action against such a huge mass of population would take the control, sit control out of their situation. So what they thought was um, they provided uh, the Kamayas with uh, all the provisions for their day-to-day -day life and thus they freed the culprit. That means they made peace without justice. And don't you think it is a rational decision? Of course it is. So peace is certainly possible without justice. Thank you. My opponent narrowed the definition of peace. Let me ask you a simple question. If in case one of your family members get kidnapped and you do not get justice from the police or from the concerned authority and the criminal is also unpunished, then will you and your family member be at peace? There are more than 15 million refugees in the world and more than 80% of them reside in Asia and Africa alone. A few days back, I read an article about the Bhutanese refugees who are living in the eastern part of Nepal. The reporter asked them what their needs were. Some said good food, good water. Some said good health facilities. Do you know what most of them said? They said they needed trial. They wanted to go back to their own country and until and unless that justice is done to them, they will not be at peace. Once in Chad, refugees whose rations were cut nearly into half waited for the aid truck to arrive just to find out that the aid relief had been stolen by the rebels who were active. So the criminals should be severely and consistently punished in order to establish peace in the country. And it is a basic necessity for the development of a country. Thank you. My opponent has focused on the idea about an eye for an eye, but that is not actually good. Where there is peace, there is justice, but where there is justice, we cannot claim that there is peace. The recent encroachment of 19 kilometers in the eastern Ladakh region of Indian territory by the China's army uh, has raised a question to the sovereignty of India. In this situation, India could have sought justice by having a war with China. Now just think, what would be the condition if two powerful countries with nuclear weapons would have fought war in the name of justice? Would there be anyone left to witness the justice? Certainly not. But in that process, they actually stepped a few kilometers backward and maintained peace through mutual understanding. You see, peace is possible even without justice. Thank you. My opponent talked about various injustice while she was coming from home to this office. We all are aware of the girls trafficking in Nepal, which is one of the major problems in our country. Recently, Mighty Nepal rescued two girls from sexual captivity in Tibet, China. If 
those victimized women were not given justice by Maithi Nepal, then would they be at peace right now? On the way to this office, towards the left, I saw an organization named Women for Justice. If peace and prosperity of women in Nepal would be guaranteed without justice, then why would they establish such an organization? The main objective of establishing United Nations organization is to maintain peace and security, ensuring justice. Finally, I would like to say that the concept of humanity should be set in the minds of people, then peace and justice will ultimately fall into place. Thank you. The quoting of sources, you know, to quote the dictionary, um, I have issues with that. You know, one of you also quoted the BBC, and, you know, is that a good source? Is that an infallible source? Uh, maybe it is necessary to quote something, but, you know, are you quoting the United Nations article, you know, and you say this is what the international community has decided in terms of what, what justice is? And, and again, you know, let me ask you a simple question. And, you know, what is the question that you want to ask us? You know, it's throwing the, the debate back to us. To say, hey, what about this? Have you thought about this? Uh, I don't care what you think. You know, I'm presenting here, I'm trying to convince you of my, my thesis. Are we talking about individual justice or collective justice? Instead of citing one example, you want to cite, you know, genocide, a massacre, um, you know, a terrorist act. Uh, and, and how would people, the victims or the relatives or those who lost their loved ones, how do you get justice when the terrorist dies? You did an excellent job, and I, I enjoy your second presentations much better than, than the first one. Thank you. If each of you had defined, in some sense, what peace is, the kind of peace you were talking about, uh, whether it's going to be that personal peace or whether it's going to be that national peace or international or that sense of internal peace, and what, what kind of justice. And I think one thing overall... Um, that you could have pulled on, Arusha, is that you could say, I'm talking about sustainable peace. Because you were, I heard, I mean, when you talked about it in terms of long term. And obviously you're talking about peace as a beginning process, which was different. Um, and she, your, your piece was, the, so two different pieces going on, um, which makes it very hard to judge this, I must say. So I'm sneaking out. <laughs> No, it's just a privilege to be here, and thank you very much. It was very exciting, and I think that uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, the topic and the content that you brought, they, they're very deep feelings and deep logics. So somehow that didn't go very well with you both rushing with time and being loud. So you could have brought, both brought a bit of reflection in your own content. You both brought new contents in the rebuttal round which was kind of a nice surprise to me. And uh, Anushka, I liked the logic behind Ladakh encroachment. I mean, I had never thought it that way. I have followed that news pretty closely. And it's amazing how you brought that content uh, in, in a very non-refutable way. Uh, Urusa, uh, your performance have been monotonous in the past. Today, you are very dramatic. And that is, that is kind of impressive. But the way you brought the debate between basic needs versus justice was something also impressive. It's a great debate that came out of both of you. While our judges are finalizing their marks, we are all eagerly waiting for the announcement of the winner of the 10, 11 and 12 English category. May I request our judge, Mr. Santosh Shah, to announce the results. Anushka and Urusa, uh, I must say in my judging of maybe more than 40 episodes of this series. This today has been the most difficult one, not just for me, but for the other judges as well. And uh, I'd like to reinstate that uh, there's a special mention round where the, one of you runner-up will be bailed out and uh, whoever is the runner-up today will definitely have a great chance for that. So saying that, I would like to announce the winner of category four, grade 10, 11 and 12 winner, to be Urusa Suwal. The runner-up for grade 10, 11, 12 English category will be Anuska Pant. Congratulations, it's official. Urusha Silwal of grade 12 from St. Xavier School, Jalakil, 
has been declared the winner of Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2013 English category Grade 10, 11 and 12. We would like to declare Anuska Pant of Grade 10 from Sri Satya Sai Siksha Sadhan as the runner-up of the Grade 10, 11 and 12 English category. Congratulations Anuska! If you are a student studying in between grade 7 and bachelor's level, you can apply for Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2014. The application submissions are open now. You can call the TYA office at 4257-250 or email us at youthtya at the rate gmail.com. Don't forget to watch the finals of the other categories of Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2013 the following week. We will be back soon with Nepal's Top 7 Debaters 2014. Namaste.